Now we're moving on to have a case study of Ghana and Halfton Lynch Mangira from the University of Oxford about how to rig an election, uh, as though we need lessons in that as well. <laughs> it's also nice to have a, a case study mixed up, so we have a, a, a multi-method quantitative and then we have an in-depth, uh, more descriptive approach, and the two complement each other nicely. Thanks. All right, well, uh, let me first also echo... Nicholas and everyone else, and thank you, Pippa Norris, for, for organizing uh, the conference. I also want to thank the project team for organizing the conference, because uh, I know from personal very painful and less successful experience that it's not necessarily easy to organize these conferences, so I really want to congratulate you on that. Thank you. Now, the paper I'm presenting is uh, part of my PhD project, which looks at the spatial patterns of electoral fraud. In, in Ghana and the reasons behind these patterns. So essentially I'm trying to establish how political actors uh, violate the electoral laws, where they do it and why they do it in certain places and not in other places. Uh, the project draws on qualitative and quantitative data including observations that have made interviews, census data, challenges, petitions and court cases. Uh, and it combines a bit unusually, it combines anthropological methods uh, and, and sort of traditional multi-level regression models. In a way, then, uh, it's an attempt of trying to respond to this call we had yesterday for more mixed method research on election fraud. Um, the paper is really the first write-up of my, of my fieldwork that I did last year uh, in, in Ghana. <coughs> Over a six-month period, I was embedded in the electoral campaigns of, of the National Democratic Congress in two constituencies in East Angana. Uh, so the data that I have really includes thousands of pages of notes that I took myself, uh, interviews, photos, and video recordings. I haven't had time to go through it all because we are talking a lot of, about a lot of material, so uh, I should warn you that what I'm presenting is really just preliminary findings. Now, the study itself was really motivated by two questions, both of which are exploratory in nature. The first was a rather sort of empirical question. How exactly do political actors in Ghana violate the electoral laws at constituency level? Do they buy votes? Do they stuff ballot boxes? Do they beat up opposition voters? How do they really do it? Now, it might seem a little simple or perhaps even redundant, but I think that often we make assumptions about what electoral fraud is and, and what it looks like, and therefore uh, go and look for something without, without having actually verified what we are looking for. So we assume, for example, that campaign, wor uh, campaign workers buy votes, and then we go and ask voters if they received anything in, in exchange for their vote. Similar, um, we assume that electoral officials fabricate result sheets without necessarily knowing that they, re that they fabricate result sheets. Perhaps what they really do is just to look the other way when something else goes on, right? Um, yeah. Hold on. So if we don't validate really how the electoral laws are violated, we might end up in a situation where we wrongly conclude that the electoral laws were not violated, but what's really happening here is that we look for the wrong things in the first place. Um, so essentially my ambition here was to really study the how of election fraud before we study the where and the why. The second motivation was more um, methodological, the second motivation was a methodological question, namely to what extent can we apply methodological <coughs> methods to the study of election fraud? Again, it is often assumed that election fraud cannot be observed. And as a result of that, um, we sort of, yeah, we, we assume that we cannot study it through observation because political actors would not allow us to observe it because it's an illegal practice. So therefore, we sort of develop all these sophisticated techniques as a way of trying to get closer to something that we essentially think we can get close to. Um, but as many practitioners have pointed out, we even heard some of it yesterday, uh, political actors who engage in election fraud might not necessarily try to hide it. They're often quite open about it. And if that's really the case, then it should be possible to observe election fraud. Now, in anthropology, there's a long tradition of studying illegal practices uh, such as patronage, brokerage, and bribery. However, anthropological methods have not 
often been applied to the study of election fraud. Of course, there are exceptions like Shafa's work on vote buying, and there's a few others in, in that body of literature, but these are really the exceptions, although they clearly demonstrate that it is possible. So what did I really find? Well, in relation to the first question, how do parties violate the electoral laws? Well, I find that they do not necessarily violate the laws in the ways we most often associate with election fraud. Um, they did not stuff ballot boxes. They did not manipulate the result sheets. They did not beat up, uh, beat up opposition voters. In fact, they spent a lot of resources preventing their own agents from doing so such things simply because it was, as I said, it would be something stupid. So they tried to prevent their campaign workers from doing something stupid. Um, instead, they violated the laws more subtly by, for example, registering minors and foreigners in the constituency, giving gifts to voters, polling officials, opposition agents, security personnel that would compel them to, to return the favor at a later point in time. Um, another thing that I observed a lot was uh, uh, rejections of ballots. They would bribe off a presiding officer into accepting a high number of, of uh, opposition, opposi ca sorry, ballots cast for the opposition. Uh, sometimes they would even invalidate the ballots simply by marking it. And again, it was all a matter of, you know, buying everyone at the polling station out into accepting these type of rejections. Now, yeah, essentially the parties thus exploited the fact that a lot of irregularities are only election fraud insofar as it can be approved that, that these were committed with the intention of shaping the electoral results. So if we return to our discussion yesterday, yesterday about first and second order malpractices, I guess in a way this calls for a third category in between um, a one and a half order malpractice which essentially those irregularities that might appear as mundane issues, but that in fact involve bigger violations of the electoral laws. I guess it's similar to, to what Jörn uh, suggested yesterday. Um, and this is really a category that I think we must take serious and, 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 and look further into. I, I should mention that a lot of work has already, or some work has already been done, uh, including by Naomi, who is here. Um, but I really think that this is just the tip of the iceberg. We need to look further into this gray zone between outright ricking and uh, misadministration or maladministration. Um, yeah, and I should point out, this is not just a matter of whether the fraud is committed before or after the election as opposed to election day. You know, we are talking about a sort of a, a, whole, a whole list of different types that, that the results can be man manipulated. In relation to the second question, to what extent anthropological methods can be applied to the study of election fraud? Well, my experience was certainly yes. Uh, the parties were very open to talk about it. They allowed me, for example, to see lists they had prepared of, of foreigners who had registered illegally in their uh, constituency. They allowed me to take photos when money and food was handed out on election day. Uh, at the polling station, uh, at the at polling station level, yeah. Um, of course, there are a lot of practical and perhaps even sort of ethical considerations or problems around applying anthropological methods to election fraud, and it takes a lot of time. Um, in addition, there's always the question of whether the findings from a single constituency, or in this case, two constituencies, to what extent they can be applied to all constituencies in a country or even in a country or even beyond that country. Uh, so there's a lot of problems to it, but, but generally I think it's possible, particularly if this type of work is combined with large-end studies or more traditional statistical research. Um, for example, it can help us narrow down what type of offenses are we really looking at, or it can be used to perhaps explore further some of the correlations that we pick up in our statistical research. So we might find a correlation, but through process tracing methods, we can actually sort of establish that there is a causal relationship between the different variables. Um, what I did in this particular study was to, to, to map what I call electoral itineraries meaning the different legal and illegal steps that political candidates, candidates and agents take to win the elections. 
The advantage of this approach is that we don't make any sort of a priori assumptions about what election fraud is and what it is we are looking for. You simply map out what are the different steps that are taken, and then afterwards we can start categorizing these steps into which ones were violations of the law and which ones were not. So in that sense, it offers a systematic, I think one of the problems about a lot of anthropological research is just sort of you know, anecdotal evidence that's you know, mixed together. But I think by, by mapping these electoral itineraries, I think it's a, it provides a systematic framework for actually trying to use anthropological methods in a, in a way that can inform or even support our comparative research. Um, but again, yeah, this is just one way of doing it. It was sort of an experimental attempt of the extent to which we can do it, uh, but I'm sure there are other ways of, of, of also applying these methods to the study of election fraud. Again, I should stress that this is really, you know, it's a, it's a first write-up of, of, write of my work, so I really, I welcome any thoughts on how to take this further. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Halfton. And there's one reference you haven't made, which of course won't have occurred, but really rings for me. Cornelius O'Leary wrote a wonderful book on corruption in 19th century Britain between the 19, sorry, 1832 mm. and 1867. And lots of what you're describing is exactly the same. Treating was the norm, and you gave voters drinks or food or something. And there's lots of other practices which essentially are historical in many established democracies. And so we can draw the links. There's nothing new under the sun in corruption in some ways. <laughs>